Uh, my name is Nahum Sirota, and today I'd like to talk to you about the science and the soul of mental illness. Uh, I have a personal relationship with mental illness myself. I've struggled with depression for a long time, and I actually happen to be a science teacher here at Rani. And it's a unique perspective that I find myself having. Um, having struggled myself with depression, I can also see my students every day struggling with one form of mental illness or another. And I can't tell you how much it hurts to be able to watch somebody go through something and only be able to be the person up at the front of the room talking about the anatomy and physiology of the femur. It's really hard and I'd really try to go out of my way to have a personal relationship with all of my students. Um, as you probably know, adolescence is unlike any other part of your life, right? Your brain is developing. It, it has this whole concept of synaptic pruning where it's starting to connect with other parts of the brain. And the mind is expanding as a result of that. Um, and then these teenagers, we put them in the most stressful situations, right? Because we think that they can handle it. And for the most part, they can. But when they don't succeed, when we say that you have to learn math and science and English and history, foreign language, art and music, and then we test you on it, and then we give you a number, and that number, for a lot of them, is a representation of their self-worth. So when they fail, it's a punishment. And I think that we can't afford to go on like that. At the same time, they're becoming aware of the world around them. It's no longer black and white. They're understanding the nuance and the gray area, the different perspectives. And their emotions are starting to become more varied. But their brain isn't yet ready to process those emotions. So when I watch my students go through this, it makes me confused. And I wanted to learn more about my own depression, something that could help me really process and understand it. Because without understanding it, you can't begin to get better. So I'm a teacher. See all these really nice pictures? <laughs> So I wanted to look at the epidemiology or the wi how widespread mental illness is. Everyone in here, I think, has a personal relationship with mental illness. Whether, it is a, whether you have been afflicted by it or whether your friends, your family members, or any member of your community, it is immensely widespread. Almost half a billion people have a diagnosis of a mental or behavioral disorder. And chances are that this value is completely underreported. There are many medical professionals, clinical psychologists, who believe nowadays that depression is the number one killer in the world. Why? Because depression can cause lifestyle factors that cause you to completely ignore self-care. It can cause heart disease. It can cause hormonal imbalances. It can cause substance abuse, obesity, and a whole wide variety of things that might actually hurt and kill somebody. According to a study done by the Na National Institute of Mental Health, if you were female, you had a one in five chance of having a mental breakdown within that past year. And if you were 16 or 17, similar values. Of those adolescents who had a mental breakdown, that's 2.2 million, 70% had a severe impairment. Now from my perspective, severe impairment looked different based on who you were. In some cases, it was, it was a student who just didn't want to talk anymore. Maybe they had an emotional outburst. Maybe they developed a temper. In some cases, it was absenteeism or self-harm. And in very drastic situations, it could be suicide. And that's 70% of teenagers struggling with mental illness. 60% didn't even seek treatment. And suicide is also the second leading cause of death for people 15 to 34. It's incredibly widespread and we need to do something about it. So, you come to the question, what's going on in my brain? What is going on and how can I help others? There's been a huge revolution with regard to mental illness. I don't know if you know this, but now we look at mental illness like a disease. That's progress, right? And that's incredible and when you get depression, you have a diagnosis, you go and see a medical professional and they help you out, ideally. But I think that in order to understand it, you can start to delve into what do these scientists think, because even if you do that, 
that's no guarantee of actually getting treatment. So I looked into how, what is going on in your brain to actually cause depression. There's eight fundamental theories. The first one is genetics. According to twin studies, up to 40% of people who have depression probably got it from a parent. On the other, and this is really great, right? And you, it, it's a reason, it's like, okay, it's just in my genes, I don't need to go outside, I, I, it's my genes, I don't need to worry about it anymore, right? Well, unfortunately, that doesn't cover the other 60%, and we have no idea what actual gene to look at. We don't even know if there's a specific relationship between a number of genes and the environment. So where do we go from there? There's the monoamine hypothesis, the idea that serotonin and dopamine and another chemical called norepinephrine, these chemical imbalances can cause you to actually um, fall into pits of despair. You've probably heard of drugs like Prozac, Paxil. These are drugs that influence the monoamine pathway. And they've been really useful for millions of people. Unfortunately, we're likely only treating a downstream mechanism. That's not the actual fundamental cause of depression. There are a lot of people who have taken these drugs and they, it ha either has no effect or unfortunately they even get worse. There's another chemical known as GABA. And after looking at post-mortem studies of people who committed suicide and had a history of mental illness, we found that they had similar levels compared to people who were not diagnosed. Fortunately, anytime we make a drug to do it, Nothing works. It could be glutamate. Devising drugs to influence the glutamate pathway has also helped people with depression. But as you can see from the pie chart, glutamate is the most common neurotransmitter in the entire brain. By targeting glutamate, we're not only influencing emotions, we're probably also influencing motor coordination, we're also influencing personality, fear, everything. So there's gotta be something else, right? Maybe it's brain damage. In a lot of people who've had neurodegenerative disease, a lot of people who've had concussions, they are more at risk of depression. Unfortunately, it's really hard to actually find an underpinning, a molecular understanding of what's actually going on. The other thing is, maybe it's just certain regions of the brain are overstimulated. So we come up with electrostimulatory therapies to try to treat it. Doesn't work. It may, may help some person really good, but the other 10 people we test doesn't work so much. Two more hypotheses. The first one, the next one is stress. There are two parts of the brain called the hypothalamus and the pituitary glands that control hormones and the part above your kidneys known as the adrenal glands that release adrenaline. This is, part, this is the stress response system. And as we know, stress absolutely is a cause of mental illness, right? And it causes you to, to process the world in a completely different way. You feel like you're physically in danger. Unfortunately, we devise a drug to influence it. Doesn't really help. Last one is circadian rhythms. Your sleep and wake cycle. The activity that your brain does over the course of 24 hours. We have found that if we manipulate it a little bit, it can help people feel better. Unfortunately, we still don't know what the cause of depression is. We have eight fundamental theories, but we still don't have any idea how it works. Okay, so in summary, there is no uniform theory, uniform theory for how depression works. And I gotta tell you, I'm a science teacher, right? This is incredibly frustrating for me because I, ha I felt like, like, it, like science had let me down. So logic and reason and, and, and things I can see and feel and touch, that's my anchor to the world, right? That's how I understand the world. That's how I help my students come up with cognitive schema to do it. And science, I felt like, had let me down. Don't get me wrong, if, if a person is being treated well for depression on drugs, that's great, but it doesn't help everybody. So, what, did I, what could I do? I was still struggling with depression and I saw students still doing it too, so I sought to change my behavior towards a more healthy manner. I started hanging out with friends. Some of them are here today. <laughs> I started exercising a lot. I started doing a lot of martial arts and really throwing myself into my hobbies. As you know, depression tends to let you, make you lose concept with who you are. So this was really difficult. Cooking. 
reading, and self-care. All of these things I thought could help me with my depression, help me forget what's going on in my head. And guess what? It really worked for like a week. <laughs> Maybe a month, and sometimes I would fall back into a pit of despair, and then I would try to re reignite that kind of passion again, and it would work again, but there was something missing from this treatment that I had devised and that I was working with therapists to do. So I began to seek mindfulness. Mindfulness is a way of seeing the world, a way of observing the present moment without judgment. One of the fundamental issues with depression is that you lose sight of who you are. And no drug can fix that. My favorite metaphor of depression is that you can think of yourself, your spirit, your soul, whatever it is, as a giant tree trunk. It's a giant oak tree, and depression or mental illness is a vine, a parasitic organism surrounding that tree and choking off nutrients. It interweaves through the trunk, it goes through the root system, and it chokes off the branches and doesn't allow anything to live. Drugs, electrostimulation, can be the ax that you take that hacks away at that vine and rips them off and allows the tree to continue to live. But there is no drug that has been built yet, no electrostimulatory therapy that can reignite the root system that can re-stimulate photosynthesis and allow the tree to thrive and grow. For that, you need to turn to something besides just the physiology of the brain. We all know that the brain can influence the way you see the world, right? All you have to do is look at somebody with a neurodegenerative disease or a concussion or something else, right? But if the brain can influence the mind, is that a two-way street? Could the mind influence the brain? This is what mindfulness can do. It is a way of training you to have a different mindset. So I decided to look at the science of mindfulness. I'm a scientist, right? There's a lot of issues with the, with the studies, a lot of confirmation biases on the part of scientists, a lot of bad samples, but in spite of all that, this is a young field, and so there are five brain regions that in response to mindfulness, will actually be enhanced in functionality. More neural activation, and these four regions are coupled. They begin to communicate with each other more easily. By the way, all these brain regions have to do with attention, emotion, and self-awareness. This is, this is an example of the mind influencing the brain for the better. By the way, we also observed diminished activity in the amygdala, the part of the brain responsible for fear processing and, and usually impulse control issues. Now, I'm still very uncomfortable with mindfulness because I'm a scientist, right? I need to have something I can see and feel and touch. And you don't talk about mindfulness without talking about spirituality or God or something extra from your body, right? So I'd like to leave you with a quote from Carl Sagan who said that science and spirituality are not opposites. Science is a profound source of spirituality. And the fact of the matter is, is that if we want to help our teenagers deal with stress, deal with emotional upheavals, and deal with trauma, it cannot be from a strict physiological point of view. We need to reignite their passions for life. We need to reignite their love of their selves. And if they don't love themselves, then we have to love them unconditionally and teach them how to love themselves. Thank you.